Hello friends, welcome to my channel Igno Center. So friends, today we will deal with MG06 solve assignment and we have already completed question number one in part one of our video. So if you are not watch yet the video, you may go to our video list and check out. So this assignment will help for July 2022 and January 2022 session and the assignment is for American Literature MG06 so let me read the question which we will going to deal with today so we have already finished with question number one and now we will deal with question number two and three which is write a critical note on the dramatic form in the 20th century and discuss the development of the revolutionary prose in america so friends this will carry 20 20 40 marks to you all and i am not getting anything so please make subscribe to our channel it will help me to make more video for you all and there was also a link given on the description box which is our vlog channel so you may see me there so please make subscribe on that too so let's move to our assessment now so here is our soft pdf and you will check the questions here so number two write a critical note on the dramatic form in the 20th century and number three discuss the development of the revolutionary force in america so let's move to question number two and deal with it so friends here is our question write a critical note on the dramatic form in the 20th century and the answer for this question is the 20th century witness the deployment of many new forms of drama such as modernism expressionism impersonalism nationalism and realism influenced by the ideas of sigmund freud many artists began to find a psychological approach to theater that emphasized the inner dimension of the characters on stage this was carried out both on the stage in acting style and outside of the stage in playwriting modernism was a predominantly european movement that developed as a self-conscious break from traditional artistic form it represents a significant shift in cultural sensibilities often attributes to the fallout of world war one at first modernist theater was in large part an attempt to realize the reform stage on nationalist principle as advocated by elimi zola in the 1880s however a simultaneous reaction against nationalism urged the theater in a much different direction at the beginning of the 20th century many view theater as an all too popular affair frequently the true reforms of the early part of the century called for increasingly smaller theaters where their technicals could register on a select audience still this same practitioner often dreamed that their art would be a true people theaters or theater for the people inspired by an understanding of the greek theater and heavily influenced by Nietzsche, they sought a profound or ecstatic ritual events that involved music and movement in a space without a prosium art later dramatic like Bertolt Brecht started an attempt to bridge the gulf between modernism and the people. Significant figures and some landmark theories and movement of the period include Constantin Stanislavski, 1863 to 1938, and his system a nationalist method of drawing on the actors own emotional memories to convey a character's 
do and emotions at tonin or doubt 1896 to 1948 and the theater of cruelty a plan to focus the audience to set their illusions mm. the theater of cruelty can be seen as brick with traditional western theater and a mean by which artists assert the sense of the audience and allow them to feel the unexpressed emotions of the subconscious while attract was only able to produce one play in his lifetime that reflect the tenness of the theater of purity the works of many theater artists reflect his theories these artists include Jen Jeanette Jersey Gortowski and Peter Brook, Bertolt Brecht, 1898-1956 and Epic Theatre, a reaction against Stanislavski naturalist method. Epic Theatre makes clear that the audience is watching a play and Artifice. Epic theater was a reaction against popular form of theater, particularly the Nestorist approach pioneered by Konstantin Stanislavski. Like Stanislavski, Richard disliked that solid spectacles, manipulative plots, and highlighted emotion of melodrama. But where Stan Slavisky attempt to engender real human behavior in acting, though the technicus of Stanis Slavisky system and to absorb the audience completely in the fictional world of the play, Brett saw Stanisky mythology as producing escapism. Brett own social and political focus depart also from surrealism and the theater of cruelty as developed in the writing and dramaturgy of Antony Artois who sought to affect audience vice serially psychologically physically and irritationally. Lee Starsberg 1901-1982 and Matthews acting which trains actors to draw upon their own emotion and memories to convincingly portray a part. Samuel Beckett 1906-1989 and Theater of Absurd in a modern world without meaning of purpose, a place, dialogues, plot and character give up the theater of logic or message. Hence, Thais Lehmann's theory of post-traumatic theater focus more on effect on the audience than on the original text. So friends, till here we have completed question number two. And once again, I have to say that if you are new to our channel, make subscribe to our channel and the given description box, you will get a link of my channel, which is related to my vlog. So please make sure to subscribe to this too. So friends, let's move to question number three. Discuss the development of the revolutionary prose in the America. And the answer for this question is, it was in nine. 1760s that American started to resist the domination of British Empire over the English colonies in North America. This resistance was actually and ironically initiated by the British Act of Omission and Commission. At first the attempt was made to stop the colonials to move western wars into the interiors. 
द रीजन फॉर दिस अटैम वॉज टू स्टॉक बोर्डेंसम इंडियन वर्स विच वुड बिकम मोर प्रोबेबली विथ द माइग्रेशन ड्यूरिंग दिस पीरियड इंग्लैंड कंट्रोल थ्रो द रोयल ऑफिशियल द फर्ड ट्रेड विथ इन द इंडियन टेरिटेट डिफरेंट सेंट्रलाइज लोकेशन इंडिया डिड नॉट लाइक द अथोरिटेरियन वे ऑफ ब्रिटिश एंगर बाय द अथोरिटिक डीलिंग ऑफ ब्रिटिश एंड इंडियन लीडर पोन्टेक वेक वार अगेंस्ट द कोलोलियस हिज आइडिया वॉज टू ऑस्ट द ब्रिटिश एंड विन द कम बैक ऑफ फ्रेंड्स द ब्रिटिश ऑफिशियल इस्टेब्लिश द प्रोक्लेम लाइन ऑफ सेवेंटीन सिक्सटी थ्री आफ्टर द डिफिट ऑफ पोन्टेक दिस लाइन वॉज इस्टेब्लिश अलॉन्ग the trust of the alliance and was declared that the colonials must not cross it until there was an effective indian program in action in 1764 Parliament passed the Sugar Act to counter smuggling of foreign sugar and to establish a British monopoly in the American sugar market. The act also allowed royal officials to seize colonial cargo with little or no legal cause, unlike previous acts which had regulated trade to boost the entire British empire. economy the sugar act was designed to benefit england at the expenses of american colonists as a further measure to force the colonists to help pay off the war debt prime minister grenville pushed the stamp act the parliament in March 1765 this act required american to buy special watermark paper for newspapers playing cards and legal documents such as wills and marriage license volunteers face sorrowless trials in nova scotian vice admiralty courts where guilt was presumed until innocence was proven like the sugar act the stamp act was aimed at raising revenue from the colonist as such it elicit faris colony resistance in the colonies legal pamphlets circulate condemning the act on the grounds that it was taxation without representation colonists believe they should not have to pay parliamentary tax because they did not elect any member of the parliament they argue that they should be able to determine their own tax independent of parliament the stamp act granted the first wave of significant colonial assistance to british rule in late may 1765 the virginia house of burgs Gesses passed the Virginia Resolve, which denied Parliament right to tax the colonies under the Stamp Act. By the end of the year, eight other colonial legislatures had adopted similar position. As dissent sent separate through the colonies, it quickly became more organized. Radical groups calling themselves the Son of Liberty, Liberty form throughout the colonies to channel the widespread violence, often burning stamps and threatening British officials. Merchants in New York began a boycott of British goods and merchants in other cities.
soon joined in. Representatives of nine colonial assemblies met in New York City at the Stamp Act Congress, when, where they prepared a petition asking Parliament to repeal the Stamp Act on the ground that it violated the principle of no taxation without representation. The Congress argued that Parliament could not tax anyone others outside of Great Britain and could not deny any one a fair trial, both of which has been consequences of the Stamped Act under strong pressure from the colonies and with the economy slumping because of the American boycott of British goods, Parliament repealed the Stamped Act in March 1766, but at the same time, Parliament passed the Declaratory Act to solidify British rules in the colonies. The Declaratory Act stated that Parliament had the power to tax and legislate for the colonies in all cases whatsoever, denying the colonists desire to set up their own legislature. This, however, was ignored by the colonials. And these upheavals in the colonies were beginning of something much bigger than British had in mind. They were still under a false impression concerning their relationship with the colonies, for they thought of colonies like a dependent child who could be forced or convinced to obey, but something different was boiling deep down in the colonies, of which the British were completely unaware of. The people of colonies had a problem of considering themselves as an extension of English identity. This feeling was growing stronger every day. During the course of patriotic movement in the North America colonies, people in America realized that they were so not like the British and they and that they were quite different. During the third and fourth decades of 18th century, this growing self-consciousness started to appear on the colonial newspaper in the form of names and symbols. There was a huge acceleration in this self-consciousness after the 1760s. With the growing glove between colonists and the British, all the 13th colonies in North America realized that they had a common enemy. This helped them to realize for the first time that they share something and that there was a sense of common identity and common purpose. But there was a problem that these people in the colonies faced. The problem was that if they were fighting against the British, then what should they call themselves? Earlier or, of course, they had called themselves British, but now the use of this term was losing popularity. Sometimes these people have considered themselves living in what they called America. During the time when all the 13 colonies share the same sense of self-awareness, this name became more popular and cropped in magazines like the American magazine first came out in 1741. Something similar happened in British as well. Even English had problem calling these people in the colonies British. Therefore, they too required a name to address this crowd of irritating and troublesome people. They started referring to these peoples as Americans. Back then, this meant disdent and disgust for the British. During 1760s, people in colonies, in their attempt to distinguish themselves from the English, started to call themselves Americans. From this time, for this name meant disgust for the British. Many predicals 
journals and literature saw the use of this name. The frequent increase every day and very soon become the last naming for the people living in North American colonies. The evolution of revolutionary force happened under the same circumstance described above. In the history of American Revolution 1789, David Ramsey's talk about the importance of revolutionary force in recounting the saga of American Revolution. It says, in establishing American independence, the pen and the press had merit equal to that of the sword. This statement can be looked at from two different perspectives. Looking from the first perspective, it appears that the writing about the historical events are as important as the event themselves. As far as the representation of the events are concerned, and different writings about American Revolution were not at all an exception to this. Looking from the second perspective, it seems that events are inspired by the writings. The revolutionary sensibility of American was expressed in the writing much before than the revolution happened. In this regard, Robert A. Ferguson says, Wikini, the sorts and scribbles, the conception which in times blurs the line of distinction between thought and act. Somewhere a legitimate rhetoric of opposition grows into the outrageous possibility of revolution. In this regard, Jeremiah Dummer's defense of the New England character 1721 is imperative. He was a British American colonial agent, author and benefactor of Yale College. Dummer has been considered one of the best colonial agents prior to Benjamin Franklin, he labored diligently to promote and promote the interest of the colonies. He represented before the British government. His most notable action was his uh, uh, defense of the New England character uh, charter of work written in 1715. These pamphlets use Lockean's percepts to argue against any alteration of existing New England Charter right. After they had been attacked in Parliament, the work was later pressed by John Adams, who called it one of our most classical American production. Adam also said in 1880 that the feeling, the manners and principles which produced the revolution appeared in as vast abundance in this work as any that I have read. It is interesting to note that while Dummer called the idea of colonial revolts as ridiculous, Adam won on the other hand, round his work is important handbook of the revolution. The idea of revolution is reached by Dummer only to be dismissed. He said it would not be more absurd to place two of his majesty beef eaters to watch an infant in the in this cradle that it don't rise and cut its father road and then to guard these weak infant colonies to prevent their are seeking of the British yoke. Dummer's concern in his book was about the arbitrary power of the crown, the unnatural insults to colonial right and the oppression of royal governors. What Adam see as the voice of revolution in his book is the interstic of redistribution of anticipation. The voice itself was not aware of the fact 
of it begin a revolutionary discourse during the 1760s and 1770s a great deal was made of the facility of the colonial revolutionary writers many of the great feature figures in america by john dickinson benjamin franklin and thomas jefferson a great intellectual as they were in britain and the reader in britain noticed this fact in their writing even the most die hard british fan to see the influence and analogies in the various different argument proposed by the colonials all this argument assert and emphasize the enthusiasm about the revolutionary rather than the hesitation the protest and it was not the enthusiasm but the hesitation which chatters the ill visionary growth of colonial protest so friends still here we have completed with question number 3 2 and hope this was helpful to you all and if you are new to our channel just make subscribe to our channel and you in the given description link you will get my vlog channel please make subscribe to this too thank you